This is the BMW R12, completely new for 2024, and I think it's fair to say, a little unconventional for the cruiser motorcycle genre. Thing is though, I actually think that it might be for the better. And so in this video, I'll tell you exactly why. Now, when you think of a typical cruiser, you probably think of brands like Harley Davidson and Indian. And almost universally with those bikes, you'll find a big V-twin right in the middle of them. This, my friends, is the R12's first deviation from the norm, with the signature Boxer twin responsible for shoving it along. So instead of the aggressive growling engine note, You've got the smoother bark of the boxer and also the famous side-to-side -side wobble when you start it up. Plus, the way that it feels out on the road is totally different too. I associate a cruiser with being low revving and focused on bottom end grunt, and while the R12 does deliver plenty of torque, it also climbs quite eagerly through the rev range to make 95 horsepower peak. Now I dare say it could make even more with the R12 9T Roadster sibling making the full 109 horsepower possible from this engine. Unfortunately, the R12 is capped at that 95 horsepower to make it legally restrictable down to A2 license compliance, but it still feels like plenty enough, and it's a surprisingly quick bike with a nice snappy response on the throttle. Then you've also got the way that it goes around corners. For me, a cruiser is normally fairly hampered in the handling department on many fronts when it comes to chassis design. Normally you'll find a bike with a big long wheelbase that's stable in a straight line but a bit more reluctant to turn. Weight is usually well up over 250 kilograms and suspension is generally on the budget end with very little in the way of travel, especially on the shocks. Brakes are often a single front disc with a a larger than usual rear disc that requires you to use both to stop quickly. And on bikes like the Harley Sportster S, the Indian Scout Bobber, the Triumph Bobber, and even the old air-cooled Harleys like the 48, big balloon front tires are part of the look, but I'm pretty sure you can guess how that's gonna feel. The antidote for me is the R12 with a spec sheet that reads much more like a sporty, naked, retro roadster. It's 227 kilograms fully fueled up, so almost 25 kilos less than a Triumph Bobber, for example. And suspension comes in the form of a 45 millimeter upside down fork, a mono shock at the rear mated to their single-sided shaft-driven swing arm, and while suspension travel is still fairly modest with 90mm at each end, it's certainly a lot more than the likes of the Triumph Bobber, Indian Scout Bobber and Harley Nightster. Braking is up to spec with two big 310mm discs at the front, each being clamped down on by a radially mounted monoblock Brembo caliper. Wheel sizes are typical for a cruiser with a 19 incher up front and a 16 at the rear, but the front tire is slim and out on the road this bike feels light, nimble, flickable and agile. On top of that, the ride quality is decent too and the brakes actually work without having to also stamp on the rear. Now another area in which this bike I think stands apart from the market is with the tech package because I think simplicity is almost celebrated with cruisers and some of the bikes are so simple that they only really fit ABS because they legally have to in order to sell them. Granted, the new Indian Scout has a few different levels of tech available. Harley have tried to modernize bikes like the Nightster, and the Triumph Bobber does have a couple of riding modes and cruise control. But I would largely say you're looking at bikes that are pretty stripped back when set against the rest of the market. Here though, well, you've got a few different choices. As standard, it comes with a simple, single, analog clock with an LCD display set into it. And you can choose from two riding modes of Roll, which is more chilled, and Rock, which is more sporty. And while the naming is a bit corny, there's a nice distinction between the two when you put them to use out on the road. But if you want a little more in the gadget department, then you can also spec it up with a second clock so you've got a rev counter too, or perhaps a better deal at 120 quid is their mini TFT display, which was fitted to the particular press bike I was borrowing, and I really like the clean, almost custom look of this one. 
As standard, you've got lean sensitive traction control and ABS, plus keyless ignition and a USB charging port. But delve again into the accessories catalog and you've got loads of options to upgrade to cruise control, a quick shifter, heated grips, hill start control, tire pressure monitoring, their emergency SOS button and more. If phone connectivity is your sort of thing as well, then they've also got their connected ride control and this enables you to mount your phone on the bars and use it as an extra display with maps and data about the bike, but still control it with the main switch gear. The R12 basically inherits some of BMW's best technology, and you can spec it how you like from a fairly simple standard bike up to something with pretty much all the bells and whistles, and I like that it feels like you're only paying for the stuff that you've opted for and will use. In the looks department, I'd also say it's a bit of a departure from the standard cruiser template, which can quite often involve a lot of chrome and bling and some commonly used shapes and ideas. In a way though, it was never going to look like a Harley clone because fundamentally it's built around their boxer twin and it does kind of dominate the overall stance of the bike. But I'd say that's a good thing. It's a bike that looks like a BMW rather than a poor copy. And I think that's for the better because it's got its own identity. On top of that, the finishes are clean and classy and the build quality feels excellent too. Now look, we're getting to the point here where you could rightly question whether this bike truly fits into the cruiser category or whether it's actually more of a retro roadster. It's quick, it handles well, it feels compact and light, and the looks are subtle and relatively subdued. But I will say there are a couple of things about this bike that do help to anchor it in that part of the market. Firstly, the riding position, especially when you're jumping between the more sporty 9T and this, feels like a mild cruiser. The seat height isn't super low at 754 millimeters, but it's low enough that you feel like you're sat down and back, and the reach to the floor, even for someone who isn't particularly tall like myself, is super easy. Forward foot controls simply aren't an option when you've got a pair of big cylinder heads in the way, but I will say the pegs are far forward enough to feel like a typical mid-position cruiser. Then the handlebars are nicely set with enough of a rise and backwards sweep to give you that commanding sat up position. But another part of feeling like it's part of the cruiser scene, I think, is the level of customization. And I think there's just enough there to make it feel like you can make your R12 distinctly your own. The base model comes in a stealthy black. I borrowed the Aventurine Red Metallic, which I think looks quite classy. Or if you want something with a kick, then there's the Option 719 Thorium with a graphical design on the tank and the Option 719 billet parts like the cylinder head covers as well as billet contact points and mirrors. Then there are a few different seats. You've got cast wheels, spoke wheels, gold spoke wheels, a windscreen, soft luggage and a couple of different exhausts. And so while you'll still have to go bespoke custom if you want something wildly different to what you see in the showroom, you can still go from something pretty simple like this to something more wacky and decked out like this. A word on the price too, because while undoubtedly, if you do spec the hell out of it like that, the total cost will be high, the starting price actually looks pretty good to me. Considering the level of tech and spec on the chassis, I think £11,990 is fairly modest in this market, and that means it comes in at over a grand cheaper than the Triumph Bobber, the Indian Scouts, and the Harley Nightster. So it sort of begs the question, well, why wouldn't you just buy one? Well, there are a couple of reasons, I guess, and one would probably be the looks. This is an image-heavy part of the motorcycle market, and while the R12 does look good in my opinion, it's probably not the badass cruiser vibe that some people might be looking for. It doesn't immediately scream Hellraiser, and nor does the sound from the exhaust, which is also a big part of it, where the R12 kinda lacks a bit of that visceral V-twin tone. Then there's a saying to be said for the riding experience, some people want a bike that rides like a Harley, and that's fair enough. But look, if you're someone who wants a comfy, laid-back retro that actually goes impressively well, flicks from side to side and hauls up nicely on the brakes, then especially considering the price, this one has to be worth at least a demo.
As always, though, I'd love to know what you think of it, so do let me know down in the comments below and which sort of cruiser sounds like your sort of bike. If, on the other hand, a more sporty riding position is your thing, then maybe the 90 equivalent of this bike is a good shout, so I'll put my review on the screen now so you can give it a click and give it a watch if you haven't already. Do hit subscribe as well to see more of the latest motorcycle reviews like this right here on Motobob. A massive thanks for watching today, and we'll see you in the next one.